have the morning session. Welcome, everybody. And to start with uh, Masaki Yamazaki, and he's going to tell us about the Kita Vakya in 40 years. Okay, can everybody hear me, I guess? Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, let me thank the organizers as other speakers uh, for kind invitation. And in fact, I was kind of, uh, I wasn't sure until the last minute whether I could make it. So I'm very happy that I'm here in Ascona. And uh, well, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Seta Bakya in four dimensional Yamio series. And uh, this is working in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Yuichiro Kitano, Ryutaro Matsudo, Norikazu Yamada. Uh, uh, located at KEK. Uh, if you don't know what KEK is, it's, uh, it's where the collider is, where, for example, beta 2 experiment is going on. And there is a theory group there. And, and, and my talk uh, is, is about the two papers, uh, which I put out uh, last year and this year. Uh, but the difference from other talk is that it's actually in tape lattice. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, uh, I'm not going to lose you, but uh, uh, so some of the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the 4D amyl theory. In fact, uh, it's a pure Yamil theory and no supersymmetry, no matter. But you can certainly think about adding matter, et cetera. Uh, but uh, at least my talk today is about the pure Yamil and, um, and, uh, and the gauge group is SU2, the simplest case. Uh, there is a similar story for SU3, et cetera, but there is some particular reason why I'm interested in SU2, as I'm going to explain later. And, and then they include a set angle, uh, which is the coefficient of FF theater, as everybody knows. And, and the question itself is extremely simple. So, uh, so the question is that uh, there is a free energy uh, per volume, uh, which is defined here, and uh, it's a simple function. And I want to know how does this, this, this looks like as a function of set angle theta. So it's a very simple question. And I'm sure that this question has been around for uh, since the invention of the set angle, almost like uh, 50 years or so. And, uh, but surprisingly, there are still some questions to be, uh, fundamental questions to be understood about this. And one of these is indeed uh, what happens at the uh, theta equal pi. So that's, what's special about theta equal pi is that there is a CP symmetry. So theta goes CP sends theta to minus theta, pi goes to minus pi, but theta is periodic. So it comes back to pi. And uh, that's another point uh, apart from theta equal to zero where there's a classical CP symmetry. And there's a big question. What happens to the CP symmetry? Uh, afterwards, if you take the auto dynamic IPEX into account. And, and as we explained, this is very much related to the question of uh, whether things confine or not. So uh, if, whether there is a gap in the spectrum or a gap less or not. So that's a big question in the field. Now, uh, certainly this has been, uh, the question has been around for a long, long time. And uh, there are important insights, uh, which I'm going to review. Although there are actually not too much uh, progress in this respect, but there are some. And one of them is the instantons. Uh, of course, that's uh, in the textbook computations, uh, but the hooked another. And uh, so, okay, so why don't you do the weak coupling computation, the instantons? And in the end, the one instanton contribution gives this cosine term. Uh, and, uh, and there are also two instantons, et cetera, uh, but you might expect the one instant to dominate. And whatever the structure is, the crucial structure here is that it's two pi period which is of course natural because the set angle is two pi period. So, uh, so, so the potential looks like this. Uh, okay, I'm not good at lighting the cosine function and maybe there's a cosine two sigma, et cetera. It's a little bit deviation, but anyway, it's a two pi period. And so this is the, uh, uh, what people call the discrete uh, instant on gas approximation. So instant on approximation. And uh, it actually works when the, uh, it, the theory deconfines over the, above the critical temperature. Uh, but as I'm going to see in the show in the next slide, people already know in the eighties or so, that this is not actually a correct answer, at least when t equals to zero and pure mills. This is not the correct answer. Uh, in, in fact, there's a lot of confusions in literature. If you open the Coleman's uh, lecture, for example, he says, oh, okay, there's a divergence. But, but suddenly is that there's a divergence in this integral when log goes to infinity. It's the IR divergence. And Coleman says that, uh, okay, so let's regularize, but it's fine. But actually it's not the correct answer in general. And, and the argument was provided, uh, well, not too surprisingly by Witten, and uh, in the 80s or so, using the large n. And the argument itself is actually not elementary. So, okay, so this is the uh, Lagrangian for the Yamio theory, but living in a little bit funny way, where there's a one over n, uh, so this is the h bar parameter, expansion parameter. And, and then, of course, then you have to extract the power of n, and in particular, the theta appears in combination uh, with n as a set over n. Okay, so this is a simple scaling argument. And then, of course, the assumption is that the set large n limit makes sense. Uh, keeping this as a parameter. 
And we know that the degrees of freedom of the Yamu series goes, goes like n squared because it's matrices. So the, oh, okay, I, I changed the notation, sorry. E F of theta, the free energy, scales like n squared times the com this combination. And, and then, well, there's a CP symmetry. Uh, so uh, you expect, so there is a theta goes to minus theta. Uh, okay, there is a symmetry of sending theta to minus theta, at least you expect, and then it's a quadratic expansion around theta equals zero. But if you like, there is a, a abstract, but well, not abstract, but there is a good argument by Buffa and Lipkin in the old days that the theta equals zero is a minimum. So indeed, there's a quadratic things happening. And then there is all the sub, uh, high order corrections. And from this large n argument, you can extract the large n dependence of this coefficient, which is noted by noted chi, and also the subreading coefficients, which I take to be dimensional rest, b2, b4, et cetera. That's the convention in the literature. And, and this chi goes like a constant uh, in the large n limit, and b, b coefficients, they become smaller and smaller in the large n limit. So that's the prediction from large n scaling. It's a very simple scaling argument. But surprisingly, this is extremely powerful because, okay, so you see this coefficient uh, goes like zero. So is in the strict larger limit, the only thing remains is actually just a quadratic potential. And, uh, but the point is that quadratic potential is not two pi periodic. And, uh, and some of the, so another way of saying that is that there are actually multiple uh, branches of cosine functions as quadratic functions. They are quadratic functions. There are many, many quadratic functions of order n. And, and uh, uh, so that, so you, you, in general, you are in a metastable branch kind of, and, and the true vacuum, if you want the true vacuum, you have to take the, uh, this uh, absolute minimum among all the branches. And, uh, and then the, the, well, the crucial point here is that the two pi period is lost. Uh, if you look at one of the branches and decovered only when you look at the, uh, if you take the uh, minima among, among all these branches. So physics itself, in a sense, is a two-part periodic still, but uh, there are metastable branches. So that's uh, the simplest argument uh, by written in the large and limit. And what's uh, particular, in, this implies in particular, is that if you look at theta equal pi, it's a little bit small in this picture, but the theta equal pi is the point where, oh, sorry, not theta equal pi, sorry. Uh, this is not theta equal pi. Sorry, I, I messed it up, but, uh, uh, sorry, but, <laughs> okay. But the theta equal pi, uh, okay, so this is theta pi over n, but, but it, it's, it, what's peculiar about this is that there are multiple branches coming up, and, uh, and so in general, that's the point where the two branches meet together. So if you move away from one value as smaller than pi to the other side, et cetera, you have to transition from one branch to the other. So uh, that's where the CP break, symmetry breaking happens. And uh, yes. Sorry, is this a simple question? So why do you have another minima of two pi over n and four pi over n? I didn't understand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, in fact, sorry. Yeah, in fact, uh, I think I, I got it. I got this wrong. So this is, this should be two pi. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's a mistake. So this should be two pi. This should be four pi. Yes. So uh, the only thing that happens is that there's a quadratic potential, and because there should be theta minus two pi squared, there should be another branch. Yes. So this is two pi four pi. Yes, that's a that's a typo. Sorry. And, and so this is the point where theta equal pi, where two branches meet, that's where the CP symmetry is broken. Yes. So this is the scaling argument. I hope uh, everybody gets it. And so it's hard to uh, fight against this, at least in the large n limit. Now, now the question is that a large n limit is beautiful, but there is often a question that I'm interested in SA5 theory, for example, that the large n argument apply. Well, strictly not, if you're serious, you might say strictly not, but sometimes large n limit do apply. And, and, and then, so, okay, so you might be, begin to wonder, okay, so in the large limit, CP is broken, spontaneously broken, but then what happens in general? Well, uh, okay, so say that equals to pi, uh, and then you try to uh, change the value. Okay, so this axis is like a large n, uh, n, and uh, uh, okay, so in the large limit, uh, okay, so this is actually one over n, sorry. It's one over n in the large limit, uh, so that's where it close to here. So n is close to infinity here. And that's, that's the region where CP is uh, spontaneously broken. That's what I said so far. So this is one of, this axis is one of N. And so here is sp CP is spontaneously broken. But now uh, there is an argument uh, uh, using mixed anomaly, uh, which says that CP, there is a mixed anomaly between CP and center symmetry. Uh, which means that at least one of the CP uh, or center symmetry should be broken. Well, of course, both can be broken. So uh, they can be, this itself doesn't exactly tell you what exactly the phase diagram is. So the, because both might be broken and there might be multiple regions, phase transition, et cetera. But for, for this the argument, uh, okay, for this talk, let's assume that there is a simple, simplest structure you can think of. Namely, 
either, either the CP is broken or the center symmetry is broken. So let's assume that's the case. And, and here, okay, so the CP is broken. Um, uh, but you actually expect that uh, as the value of n becomes small, so one of n becomes large, there is some critical value above pitch. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, the CP becomes unbroken. And, uh, and in this case, the center symmetry uh, should be broken. So it becomes gap pressed. So the mi there's a mixed anomaly. So there are two possibilities. You, uh, as a minimal choice, there, you, you expect the phase transitions. And this is a function. Uh, okay, so this axis n long of the uh, of the amino theory, which is of course an integer. So it's one of an integer in this case. Uh, but you can try the analytical continue, and you, you expect that there should be some transition point uh, in between. And the question is that what is the value of this n critical MCP? Um, is it uh, is it one over two, one over three, etc.? And depending on that value, uh, uh, you might expect the interesting structure, especially when SU, uh, n is small for S U n. And uh, of course, the most extreme case is SU2. SU2 is the case where uh, n is the smallest, the farthest away from a large n limit. And the question is that, is SU2 theory, for the SU2 theory, is it here on this left-hand side of this, uh, namely CP is broken, or is it on the right-hand side, is the CP is unbroken? So that's the question. And, and this is question is, itself is actually natural. Uh, if, if you take into account the comparison or analogy uh, with a 2D CP n minus one model. So uh, to the CPN minus one model, there is this SUN uh, global symmetry. So it's actually uh, people, it's useful to compare with this to the CPN minus one model with SUN. And there, uh, people believe that uh, uh, to, to know the phase diagram. And, and, uh, and then there's some, indeed, something very special happens at SU uh, CP2 minus one, CP1. And at the set equal five, and that's the, uh, that's the relative is the hard end conjecture, et cetera. So people believe that uh, among all the CPN minus one at set equal five, CP1 is very special because that's where the CP is unbroken and there is a gap rate spectrum. But all others are uh, uh, CP is broken gap. So it's like a large N. So in, in a sense, I would say that the uh, roughly speaking that it's N equals three is large and N equals two is small in this criteria. And the question is that what happens is, so if you take people take this as, as an analogy, for example, so if you take that face value, n equal two should be small in that criteria, even for 40 mils. But is that the case? And of course, this is just an analogy. But if you want to go beyond the analogy, uh, there is actually more precise connection, which I developed with Kazuya and Nekura some time ago. So you can start with 40 ml SEN super mils, compactify on S1 times T2, include the two-fifth magnetic flux, et cetera. And then you get some signal models with topology is like a CPN minus one. So there is some connection. Uh, and you can even try to match that there is a mixed anomaly here and there is a mixed anomaly here, which I matched by dimensional reduction, et cetera. So there is a more precise connection. But nevertheless, that connection is, uh, requires a lot of extrapolation from one radius to other, et cetera. So it doesn't uh, guarantee that there is a quantitative uh, comparisons uh, between uh, these two are uh, legitimate. So, so there's a big question, whether SU2 is SU2 and N equal two is small or large. So that's the question I'm going to address. And I have been interested in this question for a long time, but I must say that it's extremely hard to address this question, simply because there are very few too, surprisingly. And, and that's why I started thinking about the, uh, doing the computations in the numerical lattice simulations. At least there is a, there, there is a way to compute things. Uh, which is, of course has been a challenge for me because I'm, I'm not uh, educated in lattice, at least traditionally, uh, but at least you can do it. And, uh, and then there are some, a couple of subtleties, but there are many subtleties, but uh, here I listed only two. The one subtlety is related to the question of how you measure the topological charge. Okay, so I want to know the dependence of the free energy as a function of theta, and the conjugate variable is the uh, topological charge. So I want to know the topological charge, which is the integer. Now, okay, so the first thing you might think is that, okay, this, just discrete everything, and discrete is the definition of FF theater, and you get something. Um, but actually that's not good in the sense, okay, you can get some quantity, but actually not that good because it's not quantized, first of all. And so if you have a smooth configuration of gauge field configurations, mathematical theorem, theorem tells you that it's quantized, of course, but on the lattice, it's not guaranteed. So, uh, so for example, it might widely fluctuate, it might converge into a, a non-differentiable function, et cetera, in, in the limit, if you try to take the scaling limit. So the, all these things are included when you do the lattice configuration, because there is no notion of continuity between different points. It can be one and minus one at the neighboring point, but they should supposed to converge. So 
Uh, that, that's well known. And for example, Russia has been stud studying that and then try to get, get away this dangerous configuration by imposing admissibility and condition, et cetera. But anyway, uh, so that's uh, uh, there. The, it's it's the, the question of how to define Q itself is a non-trivial thing. And, and there are certainly people have, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't list all the references, but a uh, lot of experts have thought about that. And basically the idea is to smear things. So it's widely refractuating. So if that's the case, you introduce some smearing procedure to make it reasonably smooth. And, and, with the, and after the smearing procedure, you define the topological charge. And I'm going to show you a little bit more data, data points uh, afterwards. Now, what is the second ingredient? The second difficulty, this, was, this is the uh, extremely hard one, the sign problem. And uh, this is a well-known problem in numerical computations in Monte Carlo, et cetera. So the action we want to do uh, is the gauge field action together with the I theta Q. And this, there is a factor of I, uh, imaginary I in the, uh, in the Euclidean signature. And uh, so this is widely refractuating. And in fact, theta equal pi, precisely the point we, I want to identify is the worst point because theta Q is an integer. So uh, exponential I pi is minus one. So there is a plus minus, they contribute and they cancel with each other. So, uh, so that causes a numerical problem. And that is a sign problem. And, and uh, so, uh, so that problem is still there. I don't think I can solve it. And uh, so uh, if you want to uh, start, proceed, you have to uh, find a way to kind of circumnavigate it one way or another. And a lot of people tried various things. For example, people tried to analytically continue the value of theta to uh, pure imaginary theta, and they tried to extrapolate back to theta, uh, real theta. Uh, and which, uh, which is great, uh, except that then you have to do a large extrapolation because uh, you have to start with the I, I pi, for example, the other way to pi, which is not that close. So you have, so uh, there's a, so you can try to extrapolate, sometimes it works, but you have to know the functional form in a sense to answer to extrapolate all the way to say that equal pi, uh, which is non-trivial. Uh, if, if you don't know the functional form, and if what I want to do here is to, well, I want to know the functional form of the free energy of the functional theta. Uh, so we started doing things. The first thing is actually what a lot of people have done already uh, in other series. Uh, one is to try to expand around theta equal to zero, just a small fluctuation. And then if you do the theta expansion and then the free energy can be expanded in this form, theta squared, theta four, et cetera. So this is the same expansion as I've shown before. And then I try to compute these coefficients. And that you can do uh, without uh, uh, any problem uh, because you can use the same gauge computation of theta equal to zero. Now, uh, the next ingredient, which is actually the, the newest part you know, of, of, our, of our method is to introduce something else, which I call the sub volume method. Uh, and that's what I'm going to explain. And uh, in this method, it actually, you can actually plot the F theta as a function of theta. But let's, let, I will explain it later. Hopefully I have enough time. Okay, so let's see. So let's first do the expansion around theta equals zero. And there are certainly a lot of papers Especially, uh, well, uh, many, many papers, uh, especially the paper by Massimo de Area and others, uh, like, like that, uh, I think, group of Pisa. And, uh, so, uh, okay, so the, the first thing, okay, so first thing is to expand around theta equal to zero. This is actually conceptually simple. Okay, so you, you generate the gauge configuration at theta equal to zero. Not a problem. You can use the standard program. You don't have to modify the program. And then measure the topological charge. And there is coefficient, topological susceptibility, B2, B4, et cetera, there is already a formula. So you just measure the Q and then just measure the, uh, this uh, uh, expectation value of Q squared, Q to the fourth, et cetera. And uh, you can measure these coefficients. And in fact, uh, I was somehow interested in these coefficients for a completely different reason. I was once working on uh, a models of axionic inflation, uh, which we call the pure natural inflation, which seems to be fitting well uh, with a uh, uh, recent uh, constraint on tensor scalar ratio, et cetera. And, uh, and for some of the analysis, whether we're going to detect gravitational waves, et cetera, the precise value of this, uh, these coefficients was important. So that's actually how I became interested in this. So I, I just mentioned it just in case that uh, there is some uh, completely in independent interest in these coefficients. But anyway, these are some coefficients and, uh, and you can compute these coefficients. Try to combine, you are using this formula. So that's conceptually very simple. The hard part is that, uh, okay, so this, this, if you want to compute these coefficients, uh, you need to show the deviation from Gaussians. You have to fight with the Gaussians. Um, and uh, in fact, this is the uh, topological chart. First of all, this is how we measure the topological chart. So you just generate the gauge field configuration. It looks like this. It's not at all quantized. And then we apply some smearing procedure. So this, uh, after 20 steps or so, it becomes this green. And after 100 steps, it becomes this, which is, 
highly peak along integer points. And this certainly been known for, uh, for a long time. And what type of smearing procedure we use, there are uh, various ingenious techniques come up. Theoretically, most satisfying one is the gradient flow by Lucher. And uh, uh, the one we used in particular in practice, which is a little bit faster than gradient flow, is called AP smearing. And AP smearing is, is uh, AP stands for uh, advanced processing emulator or something like that. It's the name of supercomputer. And it happens that it was built in the 1980s at Loam and also at CERN. And the group of Loam, uh, partly led by, I think, by Parisi. So congratulations to him. And uh, uh, so, so it's amazing that people have come up with some smearing procedure. And so after the smearing procedure, this noisy thing some kind of goes away and there is you, it converts it quickly to uh, integer values. Well, of course, there you can discuss systematics, starting with how this procedure, et cetera. And, uh, but except that, uh, so sometimes people just do this procedure after say 50 steps and then just do the computations there. But we actually improved a little bit on this procedure as well. So uh, because, uh, because the, then the, the, I had a question like, uh, okay, so if, you, if it's fine to do 50 steps and then, but then how people, how do you decide whether you do 50 steps or 100 steps, or 100, 300 steps, et cetera? It wasn't completely clear to me. And indeed it actually matters. You want to get the precise prediction. So uh, this is an example of the topological charge and I keep uh, doing the smearing procedure. So this is 50 smearing steps, 100 steering smearing steps, et cetera. So, and then there's uh, this uh, red and blue, et cetera. These are the points where uh, topological charge are concentrated. So, uh, okay, this is a little bit of a uh, cartoon. Uh, of course, if the whole actual thing is in four dimensions, four space and dimension. So, but, but anyway, there is a cartoon and then you can see that after do this, so you do start from here, do the smear step to the light, down, light, et cetera. And then you see some of these charge, uh, instant charges concentrated, kind of getting smeared away. And after 500 steps or so, it's kind of gone, <laughs> if I, at least to the human eye. <laughs> so. It, it actually have, it matters how many steps you do. do. So uh, what we, we improved in this procedure by uh, first, okay, so there's some smearing procedure up to some point. Uh, it kind of goes away quickly, but then after some point, there is a gradual decrease of the topological charge. So we propose a method to extrapolate back, back to uh, say the, uh, the zero step of smearing step by, uh, uh, by finding a fit function, fit in, in practice linear function all the way, et cetera. So there are a lot of subtleties as to how to define the topological charge. Um, but you can do it, and uh, and and the land result. So uh, is the, so okay. It, we, which the, of the of our first paper is the follows. So this chi and b two. So these are the coefficients of the theta squared and theta to the fourth term. And uh, so we, we took the uh, continental limit. Unfortunately, as I said, this, this you have to fight with the Gaussians, and I have to take uh, uh, two two years to generate the gauge field configuration. And so uh, already uh, partly because uh, I don't have that much computational resources. Uh, so, but, uh, uh, but then uh, at least I, we, we did some uh, analysis and indeed uh, there, we obtained some constraints on this value of B2, which is non-zero, at least in the one sigma. Okay, so, okay, we get some value, but what does this tell us about the physics? Uh, there is a physics you can extract already from here, which is exactly the physics of whether n equal two is large or small. Uh, okay, so this is the plot. First of all, I obtained two quantities, chi, the coefficient of theta squared and B2, which is a coefficient of theta four. Okay, so let's take the chi topological susceptibility. Uh, okay, so measured into string tension. And, uh, and then this is the plot of one of n squared, one of n squared. So this is n equal to our result. And for this quantity, there are other, several other results. Actually, there are a lot of error bars and things differ a little bit. But it's true that uh, as a tendency that it seems to be relatively large. But compare with other points. So this is n equal three, n equal four, n equal five, et cetera. And people are interested in large end scaling. So, uh, so several groups have studied this large end scaling. And indeed, in, in the large end limit, it seems to fit well with this uh, linear in one of n square. So, which is the expected large end scaling. Uh, okay. So, and then, uh, and then, but then there seems to be begin to deviate at n equal two. Well, of course, this is n equal three, n equal two. There is no data point in between, no n equal two point five. So it's limited. But you kind of see well the the, the trend that it seems to be deviating. And, uh, and then in fact, this is, uh, but, but the point is that it's still not, uh, not uh, diverging. So it, you might expect a tendency to diverge at some point. And, uh, and, and so that, that's actually the point where you expect that the dilute instant approximation might, uh, might become better. Uh, in, in fact, uh, for the 2D CPN model, uh, Lucia has done down similar analysis and observed the divergence of topological susceptibility. So, uh, so you expect something like this, and uh, that's, that's precisely the point where the CP might recover. That's a numerology I have. So that's a small indication that maybe n equal two is indeed large. 
Okay, uh, so what about the other coefficient, B2? So this is the, as far as this one's concerned, our result seems to be only result. And, uh, and again, it's a fitted as a function of one of n squared. So this is n equal two, this uh, black dot point. And there are other points about n equals three, n equals four, five, et cetera. And then again, it seems to be fit low with this one of n squared uh, linear low. And, uh, and, and what's important is that there's this dotted line below. That's the point, uh, if I remember correctly, one, one, one over 12 or so, which is the value expected by, uh, obtained by expanding cosine. Uh, namely, for that's where the discrete instant on gas approximation works. And, and the point is that this uh, n equal two point, although still there are a lot of error bars, it seems to be deviate a lot from this uh, instant on expected value. And if you try to, if you're brave enough, you can try to extrapolate, and uh, and then that will match somewhere around here. So if you fit somewhere, it's like a n equal one point five or something. I'm, I'm not sure if the pre precise value matters. But, uh, uh, and which is, uh, by the way, if it's simi very similar to the value where you, if you fit some, by some function, that's where the divergence might happen. So, so it seems that uh, from this analysis uh, already, I think that uh, n equal two is actually in the large n class and the transition between C uh, CP breaking and CP uh, uh, breaking and not seems to happen equals to uh, at n equal 1.5. So it's actually 1.6 seems to be pretty large as far as this property is concerned. So that is the uh, part one of our paper. And for this analysis, we use the uh, expansion with respect to theta parameter, uh, which a lot of people have used. And so this is already a good cross check. For example, we obtain some value and then there is some we can cross check. And uh, also we, we, we became confident about the measure in the topological charge and uh, improved, as I said, uh, try to improve on the method to identify the body of the topological charge by, by the snaring procedure. And uh, so, uh, uh, that's actually, okay, that, that I could do this wasn't too surprising to me. Uh, and, but, uh, but of course, this is just the first two coefficients in the expansion. And as I said, that already shows that uh, uh, CP seems to be broken. Uh, it's, it's n equal two seems to be large. But of course, I'm tempted to just prop the free energy as a function of theta, right? So that would be amazing. And, and uh, I keep reading the literature. And uh, if you keep reading the literature, conclusion is that it's impossible simply because it is a, there is a sign problem. So there are various serious experts doing this and, uh, and people measure that, uh, this coefficient, that's it. Um, but somehow uh, we, we, we become surprised that we actually can do better. And that's a method we call the sub-volume method. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that's a new method uh, which introduced. And that is how we could plot the f of theta, uh, free energy as a function of theta. Um, okay, so what is the sub-volume method? So let me try to explain uh, this in somewhat detail. So, uh, well, I should say that this very, essentially the same method uh, was used for the 2D CP1 model uh, by this paper already in 2008. Uh, so uh, it's, it's actually very similar. Uh, instead of talking about FF theater, of course in two dimensions, they are talking about F. Uh, but, uh, but the procedure is actually essentially the same, but uh, so in a sense, we adapted that to four dimensions. Uh, but somewhat surprising, this paper is not at all appreciated, and uh, like a, it, it got ten citations or so. And uh, but uh, but anyway, I think this is uh, this is yeah. Uh, so we realized that the similar thing has been done in two. Um, but anyway, so that uh, this is the subvolume method. So what is the subvolume method? Okay, so if you take say that called pi, and generate a gauge field configuration, there is a uh, there is a, a sign problem. So you cannot do that. Uh, but uh, let's see. So what, instead of doing that. It's, it's sort of admittedly, but instead of doing theta equal pi everywhere, I take a small region inside the full volume uh, of size L, I denoted L. So the, the size of this full volume L to the fourth, that's the B sub volume. And inside this region, only inside this region, I change the value of theta parameter to be pi, for example, or whatever value of the theta parameter you want. So in a, you, you can think of this as something like an insertion of operator. And, uh, and, and in a sense, this is somewhat similar to what people usually do uh, when you evaluate the surface tension. In that case, you, in, in, you introduce a Wilson loop. And uh, you introduce a Wilson loop. And uh, so, and, and, then, and, you just, yeah, and then you evaluate it. But here, uh, we are not inviting Wilson loop, but things feel, feel in the middle. And uh, okay, then once you have, have this setup, 
uh, you can define this uh, sub, sub volume version of the free energy as a function theta, which is defined as a fast integral, but where Q is only the sub volume Q. In other words, the Q topological charge is defined as sum of densities, topological charge densities from each point, but we sum only over the points inside the sub volume. Uh, and then you can define it. So it's an expectation in practice, you measure that. And, uh, and if you take the cosine and you take the expectation value, you get the sub volume uh, theta. Uh, okay, so this is a function of the sub volume L. And, uh, and the question is, okay, so it's a function of L and what are going to do? So what we're going to do is to uh, fit this function by uh, uh, fit this uh, function, which also depends on L, I forgot to say, uh, as, uh, as a constant term plus the subreading piece, which is one of L together with all the subreading correction. And the idea is that, uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the reading piece. That is the one, the actual one we want to compute. And the idea is that, okay, so there is a sub volume, so there is a surface tension. So probably uh, there's going to be some correction coming from the surface, which you'd go like one over L. I, actually, I don't actually think there's probably no one over L squared, but it's just conservatively, there is a subreading correction. And uh, um, so that's, that's the, the thing. And, and the idea is to, ideally, we're going to set L to infinity. If you send L to infinity, this time drops out and you get this thing. And uh, okay, but, but there's, there's one subtlety, which is the type of thing you worry about in numerics all the time, which is that, okay, so you can, it's easy to say that L to infinity, but of course, the, first of all, the volume is finite. So you gotta take L to infinity. It should be smaller than sub volume, uh, the full volume. And uh, also it cannot be uh, too small compared with this uh, typical scale of the theory, which is set by this uh, uh, deconfinement ten temperature. So there is some, uh, some uh, region of this L you can take, and the question is, is the question in practice is that in this allowed body of the sub volume, can you try to fit this uh, profile well with this function one over L? So that's a big question. Sometimes it doesn't work actually, which is a reflection. For example, if you, yeah. So that's that's a reflection of this, uh, uh, in a sense, this uh, um, uh, sign problem. So I'm not solving the sign problem, but try to just circumnavigate it. And uh, okay, so this is just uh, uh, probably details which you don't matter. So there is a, you, you did anyway. You, we did the simulations. And uh, so this is how it looks in practice. So I want to take L to infinity. So I want to go all the way to the left. And uh, say take equals pi over two. In this case, it's relatively simple. It's just uh, this thing. So it's one over L. So we're going to uh, fit with the linear function. And it seems to be fitting well with the linear function. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, when you send L to very zero, cross to zero, then you get, you, you want to get the sign problem, et cetera. So it becomes worse. So, so we are going to do a very uh, tricky stuff that, okay, so this part, is, this is exactly the region I want to study, but it's hard to do that because of the sign problem. But even before coming a little bit away from that, sometimes you already see that uh, this uh, linear behavior in one of L, and then you can take that and then try to extrapolate all the way to L equals infinity uh, towards this region L, uh, this uh, towards the left. And so for theta equal, this is theta equal pi over two. Theta equal pi is not too bad. Uh, there are some error bars depending on how you fit. Uh, we tend to put some systematic error. And for theta equal three pi over two, it's the error is actually pretty large. So this is probably borderline and then probably no longer trustable, uh, this thing. So that's the type of analysis we do. And, and this is the, uh, one of the results. So uh, the one of the results is the Heuros. So here is the above the deconfinement confinement transition temperature. And that's the point where uh, discrete instant time approximation becomes viable. And, uh, and uh, at this point, uh, you expect something like a cosine function, or in other words, you expect some periodic two pi periodic function as a function of theta. And uh, uh, okay, so this is, this is the plot. Uh, this is the, uh, well, in this case, you, you can actually just measure it with the full, full volume. Uh, there, there, there's not much of a sign problem. And then uh, you, we try various different uh, things and uh, depending on how you do, there's actually relatively large systematic error. Uh, if, you, if you use a sub volume method. But, but the point is that you create, whatever you do, there's a clear trend that this seems to go decrease, start decreasing already at say equal pi. And it's not too bad compared with this uh, uh, thing. And this, but this uh, blue line is the expected cosine behavior. And you also check that, uh, for example, you can take, uh, uh, if I, you look at the behavior and you say equal to zero and the coefficient of theta squared topological susceptibility and then try to compare with uh, what people, other people computed. Uh, Etc. So there are some cross checks you can do. So here, but the point here is that uh, there is a uh, okay. It's a little, it, it's not perfect, but at least you need to see the tendency to uh, go go back and uh, and there is a two pi periodicity, which is the expected behavior. 
Yeah, so it's certainly above the transition temperature, and it's actually already okay at 1.2, uh, for example. We did the similar analysis for 1.6 uh, uh, times the critical temperature, but it's very similar. So we, in fact, the trend was so similar, so I, we didn't get that much of a uh, configuration. So it's, yeah, I mean, if, if necessary, we can start to improve the systematics. Okay, so this is the expected behavior uh, above the critical temperature where things deconfine. And um, okay, so what is the main result? So uh, this is the main result uh, for t equals zero. In a sense, this plot is the main result for the whole talk. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, free energy. Uh, I was previously writing capital F, but it's the same thing as a function of theta. It's a free energy per volume. So it starts with theta equals zero, it's zero. So that's normalization. And, and then there is going to increase. So, uh, so if you take the full volume thing, so and, and you studying the region around theta equals zero, you can just study it uh, without using the sub volume trick, et cetera. And it's the data points are given here, which is the block, uh, block uh, boxes. And, and you can already fit that with a square function and then that uh, the coefficient topological susceptibility you can compare with other uh, studies. But now the point is that if you use the full volume, it becomes increasingly difficult to go beyond certain point like a pi over two. And uh, if you want to go pi, uh, we're going to, we have to use the uh, sub volume method. And uh, so there are actually three uh, like uh, squares and triangles that are almost collapsed into one in this plot. So these represent different ways of how to uh, uh, extrapolate uh, all, all the way to, from the finite sub volume to uh, infinite sub volume. So that's the extrapolations and you can do extrapolation differently but you essentially get the same result. And, uh, and the trend is very, very clear. So it's going up, even as set equals pi, it keeps going up clearly. And, uh, and uh, so as I said, things become untrustable around set equals pi, three pi over two or somewhere. Uh, so you should, this shouldn't be taken too much at face value, but it seems to, there is a clear trend that seems to be going up. And, uh, and there is no way that it can come back to set equals zero at set equals two pi. So, um, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's the, uh, uh, the lesson. And that fits well with the, our previous result that n equal to SU2 is actually more like a large n plus. So if it's a large n plus, you might expect multiple branches and each branch is not two pi periodic. And what this shows is that uh, we are following one of the branches. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so you're actually missing one of the other branches. Oh, sorry, there is a CD happening. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so maybe it's, um, okay, maybe I should try to wrap up. So I think it's the uh, end of time. But uh, so this is the main result. And uh, so this shows that uh, 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 the things is not too periodic and the CP uh, is broken, spontaneous broken. And if you like, uh, you can, we, uh, we have also plotted the derivative too. And then derivative, there is also, it's very clear that derivative is known. In this plot, it's a derivative. So it's important it's not positive. It, it is positive at say pi. It's hard to imagine that this is zero. Um, so, uh, so that's a very clear indication. Uh, to me, it's almost like a proof that, uh, uh, well, you can debate the method for subvolume method, et cetera, but if you accept that, it's uh, almost a proof that uh, it's CP is spontaneously broken for SU2. So uh, here's a summary. Uh, um, so we, uh, I think we, at, at least when I started working this, I, I really wanted to, it was kind of my dream to find this F3 energy as a function of theta as a function of, yeah, so this plot this function. And it's, it looks like a simple thing, but as I told you, uh, people have tried in the past, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years or so. And as far as I know, nobody has really succeeded. Uh, well, well, there, there are some, some trials, but, uh, and, uh, and, and the, my conclusion is that we have done this for uh, SU4, the SU2 Yamio theory, uh, and we can go all the way to say the copy at least. And, uh, and in, that involves um, uh, uh, improving the uh, method for smearing, but also using the sub volume method. Uh, so this you can do with uh, despite the uh, time problem. And also you can do, uh, so the physical lesson is, is that SU2, um, SU2 um, SU YAMILS is actually like a large N and there is a spontaneous CP breaking. And this is very different uh, from the CPN model. CPN model case where CP1 is uh, a gap press, for example. So that shows the quantitative difference between 4D and 2D. And, and there are finally there are uh, questions. Uh, I'm, I'm, maybe further you can increase systematics so you can try other series, accelerate the phase diagrams. And uh, the final tempting thing is to try to do the case with the finite chemical potential to try to explore the phase diagram. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Um, 
can you go back to the summary slide? Uh, yeah, this one, yeah. Yes. So, so first question is why why at t equals zero we were supposed to be harder? Your three ways of extrapolating match so well, and and that t equals one point two. Ah, I see. Why, yeah, why I don't. So I, yeah, let's see. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if I, well, let's see. Uh, well, but technically, this these three different points. Okay, so first of all, I should explain what these three different points are, and the three different points correspond to which regions of the L. Uh, so, okay, there is a subvolume method. So there is a subvolume here, and uh, we want to extrapolate with this linear function in one of L. And, and the question is which value of L you take. And in practice, the value of L we can take is like a 10 to 24. 24 is the size of the whole thing. And 10 is the, the yeah, dynamical scale is relatively large, like a 10. So. So we are, we are pushing this a little bit, but only the possibility is like a 10 to 24 or so. Uh, and uh, so that leaves, I think, uh, six, six data points or so. <laughs> and the question is that which data point to take? Are you going to use uh, 20 to 22 or et cetera? So that, that's actually the way to extrapolate. And that's kind of shown here. So this is the thing, and you want to extrapolate from here to there. So th these two lines, for example, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see because it's dotted, but uh, it's a type of uh, things you might expect. So that's the so the technical translation of the question is that for somehow for t equals zero, this seems to be this plot seems to be more linear. So this is t equals zero plot, I think, and there is a similar plot for t one point. It's closer to linear somehow, and uh, and why it works? Uh, yeah. So uh, as for your original question, I don't I have no idea actually. So why it seems to work well uh, in somewhat surprisingly for t equals zero better than. Yeah, above but, but from this plot, like at t equals three pi over two, there is a huge error bar. So yes. you, you did not plot the error bar in the other summary plot, right? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, uh, that's right. So in fact, uh, right. So uh, yeah, in fact, this picture, yeah, in fact, sorry. In fact, this picture, yeah, I, I think we, we here, for example, already here, there is a error bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think this, this I think uh, we should be, is, is, oh yeah, in fact, we, we are supposed to continue all the way. So in fact, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Indeed, this plot, I don't know why there is no error bar. I mean, we have some other plot where error bar becomes larger and larger here. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for pointing that out. So that's the point where things become untrustable. But just one conceptual question. Yes. Why, why the, how does the lattice know that it should follow this curve and not go to the, ah. other, to the other branch of the plot? Uh, yeah, that's an extremely good question. And, uh, and I think that's related to the point, question that, about uh, that, the fact that, the, the fact that, uh, uh, we are using the gauge field compilation at set generate a sector to equals zero. So that's actually related to the overall problem of the levating, et cetera, you, you, you were bringing up the other day, et cetera. So, uh, so what I would expect is that uh, if we want to do, see the other branch, and if we want to see the phase trans first order phase transition itself on the nodes, then you should know about the other vacuum. And for that, I think it requires to generate the gauge field compilation at different value of theta. And, and then, then you have to copy the, uh, 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 the, the overall problem that it's hard to generate it by rewaiting. So you have to generate it on the node. And, and in fact, the similar question is observed by, for example, if you evaluate the, in the evaluation of the string tension, for example, in the string tension, okay, so people say, okay, string tension, there is a linear behavior, et cetera, so it grows. But, uh, but you expect that, for example, if you have matter quarks, et cetera, you expect that the string tension, it begins to, I mean, at some point you, you expect that there are quarks and antiquarks are generated and you pinch off, right? So, so you don't actually expect the linear growth to continue forever. Uh, but in practice, people expect uh, see the growth linear growth, and that's related to the fact that uh, uh, that that you are not finding the other vacuum. So the situation, in my opinion, is somewhat similar to that. So uh, so this method uh, circum navigates the the uh, the uh, over, yeah. So this uh, overall problem by using only the uh, the vacuum near say that you say equals zero, and and that's why it's useful to see the vacuum. But the, this uh, branch. So for seeing the, for the purpose of seeing the branch, it's very useful. But if you want to see the other phase trans, the other branch, you really have to change the uh, gauge field configuration. Dominico. So in fact, that's what I wanted to ask you. Can one construct at least the gauge configuration at two pi, which is yes. probably possible, and then yes. try to go back and see how the two meet at pi? Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it should be possible. Yeah, indeed, uh, indeed. So indeed, that's the same as the floating. Of, yeah, indeed, indeed, that should be possible. Yeah, maybe we should try that then to see how things work and. Uh... Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, yeah, probably that's true. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, well, at least when, but well, eventually the, is, well, let's see. Um, 
let's see, but is it really the same? Well, okay. Well, if you if you take this, we are inserting the we, we take the sub volume and inserting theta equal to non-zero. So we are, so we are making a small region and then changing the value of theta to two pi there. So at least in the intermediate steps, we are doing something different. And uh, yeah, so physics wise, well, yeah, in fact, I have to think. Yeah, I, I, it's not completely clear indeed. That's a very good question. So if, for example, if I find a set previously about gauge field configuration is true, then as long as we are starting with theta equal zero, that's the, yeah, we might get the same thing in fact. Um, Maybe I'm going a bit out on a limb, but uh, can you just be that if your curve is um, is uh, symmetric between the theta minus theta, then it's sort of obvious that the two things have to meet, and then it's clear that there has to be a first order transform. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, I, I would say. Yeah. I mean, what, what I'm trying to say, if you try to do stuff around two pi, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah, back yeah. is okay. the same thing. I think that's true. So there's definitely symmetry. So it goes all the way. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And of course, uh, you know that already know that the physics should be two pi periodic if you take the minimum branch. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's already guarantee that there should be another branch. And indeed, that's the one coming from set equal two pi, as you say. So, yeah. So, uh, conceptual level, I think that's that, that's that's not really necessary. But it, maybe it's it's good to see the, how it works in practice. I have also one small question. So, in this high spin theories, people study this ageless lambda theory. People you should think of as being SU lambda. Mm. So, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so is there some way of maybe extrapolating between SU2 oh. and SU1 and really working with SU1.5? Uh, yeah, let's see. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, I have to think. Maybe you can, yeah, include some extra ingredients to take the scaling limit and things like that. And uh, yeah, in fact, that's a very interesting question. And uh, because that makes it possible to identify the critical value precisely. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. And uh, yeah, I mean, what we have done so far is just taking up n equal two, n equal three, and try to yeah incorporate and uh, right. But, uh, but it's really nice to have some setup like that. Okay, in view of the time, let's uh, thank Masahito again.